Hi, everyone. Welcome back uh, to another CAN seminar. Uh, well, today we are so lucky to have Dr. Ritsa with us. She is a professor at the Lyle School of Civil Engineering in Purdue, and she's a faculty scholar there. She is the director of the Sustainable Transportation Systems Research Group, uh, campus school director of the like NSF Aspire and Aspire Adoption Co lead. Her research primarily focuses on advancing the understanding of the uh, triple bottom line for sustainable transportation systems. Uh, she holds a bachelor's degree from the National Technical University of like Athens in Greece, and her PhD was in Purdue. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Ritsa, and then the floor is yours, Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, and thank you for uh, having me. And again, apologize, I wasn't able uh, to uh, join you in person. Uh, but I'm glad to see uh, so many of you now that the camera is going around. So uh, very nice meeting you. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about mainly the focus of our new uh, NSF Engineering Research Center. It's called ASPIRE. And it's um, the acronym stands for Advancing Sustainability Through Powered Infrastructure for Roadway. Uh, electrification. Uh, this is a joint center and I'll, I'll be going over several of our university partners are, as well as industry partners and, and, and government and other uh, agencies. So I'll skip that since you already introduced uh, me. So I, I've been at Purdue for over um, eight years now and I started my career uh, in Ames, Iowa, uh, working at Iowa State um, University. So when I give uh, similar seminars to students, I try to emphasize and, and give a little bit more information about the background and kind of uh, the journey that led us to uh, win uh, these large engineering uh, research centers, because I, I really feel it's, it's what you learn during that process that really makes you better. Obviously, the destination is, is always um, welcome and, and desirable, but I feel just getting there uh, is where that growth uh, really happens. Um, so as you heard, I lead the Sustainable Transportation Research Group, and we're very interested in, in understanding and quantifying the direct and indirect impacts of transportation investments, whether those are highway investments or transit, or whether we talk about transportation policies or, or strategies. So my, macro, my background is on transportation planning, uh, behavioral travel demand modeling, and, and, and economics. Um, so I, I always kind of seek more of that interdisciplinary work and going beyond engineering and uh, reaching to social sciences. Uh, so my interest in transportation energy and sustainability uh, really um, came about when I started my career in Iowa. Uh, it was around 2007, 2008, where we had that boom in the ethanol and biofuels um, industry. And that's where I realized how interdependent both the energy and transportation systems are. Uh, so moving the ethanol, moving the, um, even the, the, the all the, the, the kind of uh, the first, the raw material to make um, the fuel, but on the other hand, how transportation relies to energy systems and, and how that interdependency will be greater when we look at uh, electrified rail, electrified uh, vehicles and, and so forth. Um, so I was able to get one of those first kind of NSF uh, projects uh, on emerging frontiers and in research innovation that one of your professors, Professor Wang had as well, uh, and started looking a little bit on that coupling between the transportation and energy network and started talking a little bit more uh, with electrical engineers and understanding more of the power systems, power markets, and so forth. Um, so based on that, I started kind of more seeking out to those type of collaborations and, 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 and exploring that kind of transportation infrastructure development integrated uh, both in transportation and other types uh, of, of systems. 
Um, so those N N NSF engineering research centers, if, if you haven't heard about them, uh, there it's it's a flagship program from the National Science Foundation. It's one of their very prestigious programs. Uh, so that those centers uh, get funding uh, for five years, and then if the, the center goes well, does well, we'll get um, an extension of funding for another five years, uh, more than which is more than $50 million over that 10 year period. Uh, the NSF expects you that through partnerships and, and, and other activities, pilots, you will generate at least four times that funding for the states where those centers are located in, but overall for the national economy. Uh, they really emphasize convergent research, so really uh, going beyond kind of the siloed discipline uh, kind of system we have now, and 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 look and they're looking at centers that have strong societal uh, impact, uh, and if possible, if if they will. Um, develop new industries or tra radically transform existing industries. Uh, there, as you see at the bottom of the slide, there are several um, stages involved. Uh, there's a pre-proposal stage, a full proposal stage that you get invited to. Uh, then there's a site visit stage where you, you get people from NSF and the review team, evaluate your team, and finally you get to the award phase. Uh, so I wanna kind of uh, show how that process looked for from our team, uh, we, we actually, uh, a small subset of the team pursued this uh, award, um, maybe even um, more than five, six years ago for the previous solicitation. And we were able to get to the final proposal stage, but we didn't make to the site visit stage. However, we had a lot of momentum. So on our own, we established a center called SELECT, uh, which is called Sustainable Electrified Transportation Center. It was based out of Utah and Utah State University. And we, we had a healthy number of industries. We did quite a few events, uh, events on our own. Uh, we launched a new conference. So we, we start, we tried to be active. So we didn't really give up because we didn't win it. We, we took that momentum and, and kind of established that, that base that make us, made us really competitive for this stage. So when we applied this time, we had broadened our team, we have refined our scope, scope, and eventually we were one of the four uh, centers that were selected um, in August 2020. So as you can tell, we started in the middle of the pandemic. So we are now in our second year uh, of, and I can share some of our work um, to date. Uh, so a little bit about the center. So the lead university is in, so in Logan, just north of Salt Lake City at Utah State University. Uh, Purdue, University of Colorado Boulder and University of Texas at El Paso are major partners. And then we have uh, an international partner that's uh, another kind of prerequisite for these large centers. And, and because as you will hear later, this, this center is about different charging infrastructure technologies and specifically wireless charging technologies. Uh, University of Auckland, was a kind of a natural choice because they're a leader in the wireless power transfer arena. Uh, and then we, we also have a few affiliated uh, campuses as you will see in the map and oral national labs are our partners. It's an energy center. So we, we definitely um, need to, needed to reach out to the labs and, and kind of mutual benefit from this collaboration. And we have a bunch of industry members as you see spread uh, throughout the country, as well as other innovation partners like uh, state DOTs uh, or different type of uh, other, other centers. So here is, I mean, I won't go through uh, this slide. It's uh, over this slide, it's pretty busy, but I want you to understand this kind of complex uh, ecosystem uh, we are dealing with. So we have are obviously the OEMs, the automotive manufacturers, and, and those we've seen quite a bit of momentum of shifting to electric and, and trying to increase sales or even as we heard from GM, only you know produce uh, electric vehicles, um, and, and then we have the fleet operators and owners. We have the transit agencies, uh, and and at the same time, uh, very very important for this center is our partnerships with the utilities. Um, 
and and on the on the other side for innovation partners we have um, the as I mentioned the DOTs and uh, any type of city planning uh, but we also have um, different uh, policy makers at different uh, levels and so forth um, so it's a large ecosystem uh, that we have uh, managed to engage so far but we still feel uh, there's room for improvement and, and engaging more more partners in it so our, the mission of the center uh, is to improve health and quality of life. Uh, we are looking into how we can make do that sustainably, but also in equitable way, and how we can promote electrification across all different vehicle classes, but also different areas. So different solutions for urban versus rural areas, and obviously different solutions for light duty versus uh, heavy duty vehicles. Uh, so our vision is to, to achieve that widespread electrification, um, in, improve um, quality of life, and, and doing that in a way that can provide access to this uh, technology across um, all different income groups and, and different communities. Um, the, the center has also a large mission on uh, developing the workforce that can support this transformation in the electric and transportation industries. And these are trillion dollar industries. Uh, so we uh, anticipate the impact to be uh, high uh, in both. And, and how can we do those kind of cross industry transformation uh, in, in an inclusive and, and diverse uh, way? So our Kind of uh, the question, I guess, why electric vehicles and why electrification? I'm sure you've seen a lot on that topic, and and I won't go a lot in detail. But obviously, the potential for um, decreasing emissions, uh, energy independence, but also where we see um, those truck fleet owners and operators see the benefits in terms of efficiency, reducing operating maintenance costs. Uh, and so forth. And, and as you know, transportation is, is a major consumer of, of petroleum and, and, and uh, emitter. Uh, so definitely an opportunity uh, there. And, and we've seen uh, the momentum that we've seen from the industry, also from, from policies and, and, and some states are maybe a little ahead than others, uh, but definitely there's a lot of momentum and the industry um, is, is ready for it. So our, our our center focuses on how we can rethink those industries and boundaries that now we design energy and power systems, transmission lines very separately than what we do with our transportation systems. How, how can we think a way to maximize utilization or reduce any type of inefficiencies? And how can we do that um, at a point in time where we know that, especially in the US, a lot of rehabilitation and maintenance activities need to take place because of the infrastructure and the condition is it, it is. So we feel it's kind of a, a good timing to think of those solutions uh, right now and doing it in a more cost-effective way. So as states are thinking of uh, let's say rehabilitating or repairing their infrastructure, how can we uh, embed some type of charging technologies to accelerate uh, adoption of EVs and, and, and doing that in, in, a, in a controlled uh, manner. So again, our vision is how can we move from the kind of the past paradigm where we go to a fuel station and get gas, how we can even not have people go to specific places or charging stations, but how can we uh, move in, in energy uh, where vehicles are? So kind of bring energy, bring the charge to the vehicles and, and integrate that with you know, parking, drive-through facilities, uh, or even uh, if we think of more highway speeds, how we can, they can charge um, on the go. Um, so our vision and some of the engineering systems we're looking at the center has to do with um, most of the technology we're looking at are on the wireless uh, space, uh, but this might range between static and dynamic charging. So for example, we look at kind of short term to medium term charging at parking stations, intermodal hubs, where you know, at, with slow speeds, as you can see a little bit from that picture, uh, taxi drivers, Uber, Lyfts can charge buses, 
to more of uh, these high power, high speed applications uh, with the dynamic wireless charging uh, on, on the go. And, and we, we call them electric roads or smart power roads, dynamic wireless charging lanes. You'll see uh, different names for those. But the idea again is how we can do that in, in a way that we co-optimize both the grid and transportation uh, networks. Um, so we like this, this picture a lot because it really shows the vision that we, we try to, uh, if we're looking at those wireless charging technology dynamic, uh, and I'll explain the technology in a bit, but it's pretty much you uh, include uh, coils into the pavement and, and based on inductive uh, charging, you'll get uh, different types of speeds, you will get to charge the vehicles as they go. Um, we focus, as I, as I mentioned, all types of vehicles, so both buses and, and trucks and light duty vehicles. And how can we do that in a, in a way that's also um, reliable for the grid, uh, how we can integrate renewable sources. And we understand because it's a national center, those solutions will very much very uh, geographically based on the energy generation mix and a lot of uh, other policies, incentives and so forth. Uh, but that's that's our um, our vision moving forward. So we are the we're many researchers in the center, and we try, as I said, not to work in, in silos, but work together, uh, and and trying to make those impacts uh, on the grid. How we can make it more flexible, predictable, managed loadings on the grid, but also looking from a mechanical engineering point of view on the vehicle, the battery uh, and the materials uh, science point of view, I would say. Um, one aspect that I'm very much involved with is the user. Um, as I mentioned, I do quite a bit of work on travel demand modeling and behavior modeling. So I'm very interested in understanding how user perceives, uh, how users perceive this technology and how, what would it take for that kind of going to that larger widespread uh, adoption and, and how we can uh, maybe um, correct any misinformation, how we can encourage uh, some discussions, how we can alleviate any concerns that communities or users might have uh, in terms of their the safety or health concerns um, related to that. And obviously we look at, at the end and that's something we really need to document. And that was a motivation. What would be the impact of our activities on the environment uh, and, um, and how we can be part of it? Um, so I, I won't go into detail in this, but uh, if uh, some of you, and I don't know how many faculty are, are in line, but uh, this is something uh, if you're uh, thinking about proposing an ERC proposal, uh, they they expect you to develop this three-plane chart. So they want to understand how um, fundamental knowledge uh, and, and fundamental insights gain can inform your enabling technologies and your engineering systems. And if there are gaps, how you can go about that, correcting them. And at the same time, what are those um, other kind of stakeholders you're trying to engage? So for example, one of our, uh, mentioned quite a bit about wireless power transfer being one of our enabling technologies, but also we look at extreme fast charging uh, as, a, as a solution uh, as well. And, and then um, pretty much I kind of explained the different type of uh, charging solutions. So in terms, uh, we are, um, as I said, the research centers, so research is all very, very important. So we have those kind of four major thrusts, but again, the idea is that all these thrusts converge to achieve the mission of the center. So we have a transportation thrust that looks more into the integration of those different charging technologies in the pavement, uh, but also looking more on the transportation network modeling, transportation simulation, how we can do even co-simulation of the transportation in grid. Um, there's the power uh, thrust that you probably imagine, uh, a lot of understanding there to be gained in terms of the power electronics, efficiency, the air gap, kind of looking more into the design uh, of the system, but also looking at the impacts and the integration with the grid and the impacts on the grid as well. Um, the adoption thrust that I co-lead looks at the behavior and modeling and the societal impacts of this technology, so that's kind of core to what I'm doing, but also working a lot with uh, faculty in, in business, 
and economics, understanding more from a marketing side, but also different public policy, even understanding perceptions of electrification across social media, media, newspaper, and how uh, we, what type of misinformation is out there and how we can um, correct that. But it also has a strong environmental and social uh, impact um, uh, component and, and, and looking at environmental and social justice. As we try to deploy these technologies, how do we make sure uh, they are equitably distributed across the population and not, for example, all going to urban areas? How What we can do uh, to make, um, not have this issue of charging deserts, but, but really um, be able um, to um, have that ubiquitous uh, charging overall. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the adoption research for us and some of the, the work I have been doing. Um, so um, this is a snapshot of our team. We have grown uh, since then uh, quite a bit. Uh, but our, our goal is to look at, as I mentioned, user acceptance and societal impacts, public policy, economy, uh, but also look at that technoeconomic analysis and, and, and feasibility. Our, our plan is to have, and I'll talk a little bit about that, those test beds and pilots that can really help drive the adoption of the technology. People will get more familiar with that, uh, try to experiment that either you know, in a real way with the physical test beds or in more kind of virtual way with some of the simulation tools we are developing and then being able um, to move that to kind of uh, diffuse in the, in the society. Um, so uh, some of the, the things we have been doing this first year is developing what we call adoption baselines. So we want to understand adoption by vehicle class. So we want to understand what is the current level of adoption, what is the, the, the current um, level of, uh, I guess, awareness and understanding uh, where we are with that now. Um, so one of the early studies we did was for Los Angeles, California. There was actually a DOE RPA um, study that will look at the market adoption and the impact uh, on, on emissions and, and also looking at the um, economic feasibility um, as well. Um, so I'm going to focus a little bit more on the, the surveys we conducted, looking more and understanding the perceptions and intentions of the public to drive on those electrified lanes and also how we um, came up with understanding those different market segments that um, could um, help understand who are the early adopters and who are probably the laggards. And, and then we used a lot of those adoption curves and I think that's what makes it very important is instead of uh, having you know, assumptions 5%, 10%, we had the much better information of how uh, that diffusion, let's say of the technology will work. And, and that was actually part of uh, one of my uh, students' thesis that got uh, one of the Council of University Transportation Center's thesis award. And, and you can see, um, you can find her paper uh, in the International Journal of Sustainable Transportation. So to understand how those electric roadways work, so I have this kind of schematic, this is for the truck. Um, so obviously you need that roadside equipment. So how it connects the utility grid and distributes power to the roadway. And this is a very important component and especially for the cost of this technology because you understand if you don't have power next to the roadway, if you don't have substations or even if you have substations but not have that excess capacity uh, to power the road, uh, obviously that's, uh, that might not work as well. Uh, so that's where you probably see the potential of having some renewable sources to, um, to help with that. Uh, then the coils in the pavement. Uh, so this is more of a power electronics or a charging kit that you can uh, that wirelessly through inductive uh, power transfers energy uh, to vehicles. So as you understand, there's a lot of work going there, understanding how how deep those kids need to go into the pavement, what's the air gap between the charge, the kind of the transmitter and the receiver, a lot of uh, interesting ideas there. And, and our colleagues in the materials kind of pavement group, they're looking into understanding, you know, how even um, 
how that affect pavement. So even the thermal properties, the mechanical properties, to understand what would be uh, that impact. And then obviously that receiver unit on the vehicle. So it is expected that those vehicles will need to be retrofitted um, so they could be able um, to recharge uh, as they move on. So going back to that study we did, uh, it was a state of preference survey, 600 completed responses. Uh, we targeted uh, residents of the Los Angeles metro area, uh, over 18 years old. So uh, we got some interesting kind of descriptive analysis, and that was back in 2018. Uh, so they, uh, a lot of the barriers back then was driving rage and also charging infrastructure. And, and were a lot of concerns about safety uh, performance uh, as well. Uh, so this is what's called kind of the chicken and egg problem. So if you don't have the charging infrastructure, you might not have the adoption. But on the other hand, we see people not willing to adopt um, uh, because of the lack of infrastructure. Uh, so we did that. Uh, there were other a lot of um, interesting information about also looking more on the conditional probability that people, if they knew they would be able to recharge to charge their vehicle on the go, uh, whether they would be willing um, to adopt uh, this technology. And, and that was uh, interesting to see. So when we look at that conditional probability that they would um, purchase an EV if they knew that charging infrastructure was available. We saw that's kind of higher intention um, to use. And we also didn't see as much of, uh, I guess, uh, intention to charge to electric buses. Obviously some of those um, factors like environmental concerns and, and being more environmental friendly and also not have that kind of noise and idling, those came into play, uh, but not a, a huge uh, shift there. So we were able also to do kind of the that market segmentations to understand who would those be early adopters. So no surprises there where we saw a lot of the younger people, a lot of the people who have used, you know, ride sharing or kind of more open to merging vehicle technologies. Uh, and, and also some that had experience with charging were kind of uh, more, uh, let's say, stated a higher uh, intention to um, use that. So based on a lot of the surveying, we did some follow-up uh, stakeholder interviews uh, with different um, stakeholders in the area, as well as the state of California. We're able to come up with what we call these S-curves of adoption, where we see at different points in time and gives you in different scenarios, what would be those curves for different types uh, of vehicles. So, um, and, and, and those were um, what I mentioned before that we're able to provide to the rest of the team so they can um, do more of an emissions analysis and also economic analysis. So I'll skip some of that, but I think we, we did quite a few um, scenarios and, and understanding the different types of speeds and different level of, let's say, vehicle miles traveled uh, converted to electric, what would that uh, look like? Um, so a follow-up study is where we look specifically at the medium duty and heavy duty vehicle. And this is a very different market segment, right? You had to talk to the truck owners, to the fleet managers, and for them, the total cost of ownership and re return investment, those are the major factors, very different than what, you know, the other consumers would look like. Um, so we, we're able to sample two, 200 firms in the US, uh, both that have adopted and not adopted some kind of uh, electric vehicles. And we were able to figure out, again, looking again at some of the barriers um, that um, availability, again, of charging infrastructure was one of the, the factors that was found that negatively impacted, you know, purchase intention if that was not available. But on the other hand, if media supported this, if uh, their organization had some social environmental responsibilities, and, and also very important, the kind of the firmographics as we call them, the number of, of tracks they operated, and also if they had um, both medium and heavy duty vehicles, and, and also the how much, many miles those uh, run.
So again, I developed some uh, similar uh, S curves uh, that we are trying now to collect. Uh, it's a much harder space for medium and heavy duty vehicles, but in the light duty vehicle space where we have also some kind of revealed preference data or understanding what, what are these on the road, we'll be able um, to, um, let's say, validate some of those uh, curves easily. Uh, we also have, um, again, in similar vein, looking at transit and transit buses. So we have another project from the DOE looking at uh, large scale transit system electrification. Uh, we work with the um, Utah Transit Authority and also the Portland one. And we want to understand, uh, again, perceptions of, of riders of electric buses. Uh, so Lake City has one route uh, being run by electric buses. Uh, and, and also perceptions of people who haven't used them and, and what they think uh, about it. Um, and, and on top of that, we also want to look at um, access to transit. So that was one other thing that DOE was interested in, how we also make the first and last mile more sustainable and more environmental friendly. Do we uh, promote you know, bike, e-scooters, uh, or do we electrify some of the Uber and, and Lyfts and what are those uh, kind of access modes uh, and ingress modes uh, for, for the transit? So this is, we, we just kind of get, get started. So I don't yet have a uh, lot of results to show on this. So another thing I'll go over is more on the techno-economic analysis. A lot of the questions we get is about the cost of the technology and whether that's a feasible moving forward and, and in more kind of applied way uh, when we talk with the state DOTs, if that's something um, they see, you know, um, that, that will pay back. Uh, so we have a group of people working more on that techno-economic analysis. So they have a very kind of sophisticated models for vehicles and also um, power models and understanding with different uh, utilization rates, the cost of electricity, but also obviously construction costs and the adoption curves we have developed and trying to understand at what point uh, that technology will be feasible, which areas, uh, which vehicle classes and so forth. So I'll, I'll share an example of a specific study we just um, uh, finished in Indiana. Uh, we looked at heavy duty vehicles. So um, Indiana, very close to Illinois, so we probably relate a lot of heavy uh, track traffic on I-65, I-80, uh, I-70. So Indiana DOT wanted us to see uh, as also a federal highway administration is moving to that alternative fuel corridor designation, what are the technologies we can integrate in those interstates uh, to support the federal highway administration mission, but also the overall uh, mission of, of, of Aspire and, and INDOT as well. So we looked at this, both the technical and financial feasibility. So we worked quite a bit with electrical engineers, understanding the topology of the kind of the grid, uh, infrastructure, uh, also the design of the coils. And that's something they're still uh, working on and to understand what would be kind of the optimal uh, design that will support these activities. Uh, we also did quite a bit of screening to understand where those technology might be more uh, applicable in terms of the truck traffic. Where do we see opportunities to partner with uh, the, the current uh, agencies when they have planned construction preservation projects, where are those kind of uh, facilities where we have um, charging infrastructure now, so where can we complement uh, by kind of uh, deploying the electric roads, but also a lot of other and very, very importantly, uh, the access um, to the power and network. And, and that was uh, published in advanced transportation um, studies. And the last but last least is the financial feasibility. Um, and these are some rough numbers here that I have. Um, we are actually working on a paper uh, and we have a much more kind of uh, final numbers there. But uh, in, in the sense for the, the, the case study we looked at on I-65 and, and for different levels of penetration of trucks, we found that payback period is not reasonably uh, long. Uh, is is around 20, 22 years, again, depending on the level of penetration. And we found it to be very profitable for both the truck operator 
but also for the, the person who owns and operates the facility. Uh, so that brings actually very interesting questions in, K, in terms of what that business model would be, how we charge for the, the, the power need, the energy needed. Is that probably more of a vehicle mile travel fee? Uh, how and so there are a lot of interesting discussions in what those business models will look like and and how will that work. But definitely we see opportunity for public private uh, partnerships and and the states are already aware um, of that. So as a follow up study, now uh, we're taking a lot of the designs actually that electrical engineers did. And we're going to do build a quarter mile test bed and, and that has received quite a bit uh, of press. Uh, recently, uh, we are just started uh, designing this and, and kind of working with contractors to identify uh, the, the segment. Uh, so th this project um, has three phases, which kind of run, uh, at least the two of them run in parallel. So that we're still gonna, um, Purdue, um, if you haven't visited the campus, um, there's uh, a new kind of uh, electrical engineering building where they have some nice garage space, as you will see. Uh, so in that picture is envisioned that they will have the coils and they can bring in uh, a truck in there and, and then kind of test that, that system a little bit better before we get kind of on the open road concept and test it there. And at the same time, uh, my colleagues in, in payments will uh, test uh, and understand, put some sensors there, if you can see from the pictures, uh, build both asphalt and, and concrete lanes, embed the coils and understand uh, both me mechanical thermal properties. So we wanna do a, a additional testing before we were able to get um, on actually a highway and, and design this quarter mile uh, test bed. Um, we haven't identified the location yet. Uh, it's probably going to be somewhere close um, to Purdue, but not, um, not, do not know right now exactly where. Uh, the, the component that I'm, more, I'm also interested in is that also brings in the opportunity to understand the community's uh, perceptions before we even build the test bed during the construction and after. So we want to see how that has changed. And, and one of the major, um, let's say, uh, components of Aspire is to engage with the community. So a lot of our work will be with understanding community concerns and um, try to mitigate those, both that those are, are real concerns or perceived concerns and how we can um, help, as I said, um, kind of mitigate the, the risks that go with that. Um, so the Indiana pilot is one of the test beds. Uh, Spire will have um, working on another test bed. Um, if you happen to travel, let's say maybe for spring break to Orlando, uh, the Central Expressway uh, west of Orlando, the Central Florida Expressway will have one mile test bed. They're looking more of a pilot. Um, not sure how soon, but it's coming. And then there's going to be more of a um, Another demo in Salt Lake City where they do for more medium and, and even port operations where they want to um, evaluate both a static and dynamic charging. And, and we envision those pilots to help really drive and set the groundwork for a broader national pilot. And we've heard Michigan announced that they want to do something similar. And there are also a number of states uh, close by um, that get into this um, conversation. Um, so I guess I'm, I think I'm out of time and you've been, or what I, I want to kind of conclude with as I'll go past here is that there are a lot of opportunities for, for student engagement. So, um, make sure you, you follow us. We have uh, quite a bit of presence in social media, also the website, but also I, I can serve as a contact for any, um, any questions you might have. Um, so I appreciate the attention and I can take any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Dr. Gritska. Are there any more questions in the room or on the chat so far? Um, yes, sir. I was thinking about how the increase in the reach of batteries for trucks 
would impact Aspire's plan in the future if it's likely that batteries life or that they are their reach is long enough for these lanes to not be needed if that's the case. Yeah, so th thank you for the question, uh, good point. So one, one observation we hear quite a bit with our partners in the truck industry is that they are not only um, driving range is obviously one of the concern, but also those batteries are very heavy. So I think they see an opportunity, obviously they won't get away with batteries overall, but they see an opportunity where they can have lighter load in terms of batteries and having you know higher load in terms of the, uh, the cargo they are uh, carrying. Um, well, I have a follow-up question on that, actually. I had the same question, and then I was um, looking at um, Tesla's website yesterday, and they said that they are in communication with the, uh, with the U.S. to have an increased weight limit for these trucks. Have you heard something about that or like an incentive to push this forward into the future? Yeah, thank you. For, that's that's a very good question as well. And we've been following the news. We actually have uh, we have established what we call market intelligence group uh, within the center. And this group, their role is to pretty much collect information like what you, you described. So that information has been coming to us and we keep kind of re refining uh, our plans. I haven't heard specifically, I know, you know, right now, uh, trucks can get special uh, permits to go beyond the 80,000 80, pounds. I know that's uh, coming, but I haven't heard more from uh, that aspect yet. But that's definitely something we'll be looking at. More questions in the room? Uh, yes, that's that. Yeah. Uh, is there any component in Aspire which is basically uh, going into the or evaluating or studying the safety or health hazard associated with electromagnetic interference? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's uh, there are several groups uh, working into that. We have, uh, as I mentioned, the electromagnetic groups from Auckland. Uh, they have pretty much all the patents related to wireless power transfer, and they have a lot of the knowledge. Uh, and then we have uh, people uh, bringing in from, from public health and, and more of health uh, experts uh, to understand. But so far, my understanding is those that those frequencies are low. They, uh, a lot of uh, even the static wireless power transfer uh, technologies that are out there and are kind of partners in those charging companies where they say they don't see any safety hazards in terms of pedestrians or people around them. Uh, but definitely they're uh, looking at that, especially if we go into those more higher power, higher speed applications. I think we had a question in the chat before uh, we move on. Okay. <clears throat> Um, how is the energy transfer to charge vehicles affected by depth through the asphalt or concrete? The coils are shallow in the road. Uh, how does this affect regular repaving processes? Yes, and another great question. Yeah, so definitely, and that's something that I think I mentioned in that phase two of the project we have that we're going to uh, test in the advanced pavement testing facility here at INDOT. Obviously, um, you don't want it to be very too uh, deep in the pavement. On the other hand, you don't want it to be, you know, kind of uh, flush with the surface for, uh, you know, repair maintenance issues. And, and they're trying to optimize what that optimal air gap. So obviously for light duty vehicles, that's a different thing. But if we're talking about tracks with a higher center of gravity, that's a different question there. Uh, a lot of our also knowledge comes from other pilots in Europe and Sweden has a few and, and Sweden, as you know, experience also kind of a harsh wet winters. So we want to learn from them a little bit more on the maintenance side. Uh, we believe we, they have retrofitted some of their maintenance vehicles, regular routine maintenance of the pavements. Uh, but we get a lot of questions about um, going on, you know, in terms of repair. Uh, the, the construction process we are looking at right now for the test bed will be in a more kind of prefabricated uh, way. Um, so we'll, we'll have uh, the kit kind of installed and insulated in those pre prefab concrete and then uh, use that construction uh, technique. 
Uh, we had another question in the room. Okay. Also, also in line with that um, uh, question uh, with the toll road, what is the anticipated um, lifetime for those kits, right? Because it's one thing to maintain the road, but it's also one thing to maintain the component for that on the go um, charging. What is the outlook on, on the lifetime for those? Yeah, uh, so I, I should know the number and I know I, I you know, my, my colleagues in electrical engineering have told me uh, it's, it's pretty high. So I would say that, that our experience has been uh, they don't really require that maintenance inside the kit. Where they see potential for more regular maintenance is the cables connecting with the substations and the grid. And that's where, where a lot of that cost uh, goes. And, and also I wanna kind of clarify, the expectation is that you don't have all those coils on all the time. So it will be more of, you know, it has to have a lot of communication systems where those activate. So it's not that you're gonna use, a, a, you know, the utilization rate might not be as high all the time. I think we have another question in the chat. Uh, two? Two, yes. Um, one is from Professor Alkari, he says, Thank you for the informative presentation. And are you expecting um, the wireless charging to use local energy harvesting? Yes, I, ideally that's our, uh, and I know my colleagues in electrical engineering looking at that, uh, how they can integrate with uh, renewables. Uh, but also we've been talking with utility companies here in the state. And they, I mean, one of the information we got pre, and they were pretty, let's say, uh, strong about it is in some cases, especially interstates, they don't think they have that excess capacity to support, you know, electrification, at least of the adoption levels uh, we are looking at. Uh, so definitely they feel, see an opportunity to integrate renewables or invest in additional substations. And uh, another question from uh, Shirley. Um, um, I'm curious about what kind of methods you applied when analyzing the adoption of LDD, MDD, and HDD for the long term. There are two graphs that show the adoption uh, trends. Yes. Uh, yes, I didn't go into the details. I love that detail you can find uh, in the papers, and I'm happy uh, to send uh, the presentation. Uh, so. Uh, it's basically econometric models. So when we looked, for example, at the Los Angeles survey, we did a, a bivariate ordered probit model where we kind of jointly estimated the probability of someone buying electric vehicle given that they know uh, electric roadways uh, are coming. Uh, in some other cases might be uh, some, um, I think the heavy duty vehicles was a random uh, parameters order model where we could, uh, we found there was quite a bit of heterogeneity across the track fleet owners and, and firms we uh, surveyed. Uh, so we use that kind of random parameter specification to account for that uh, heterogeneity. But I'm, I'm glad to share the papers for just a much more insightful uh, look into the, those models. 